seem to jive and harmonize 100%. One verse says there was one angel in the tomb. The other verse says there was another angel in the tomb. Let me ask you a question. Let's just think for a moment. If the Gospels were identical word for word, wouldn't people even more suspect foul play? If we had four Gospels that read identically, people would go, oh, well, this isn't the testimony of four men. This is the testimony of one man. And he wrote four names on it. You see, the fact that they disagree in some places is good news historically because it shows we have different accounts. Some of them are eyewitness accounts. The Gospel of Mark is really the Gospel of Peter. Peter was not very literate, and he dictated it. We know that by reading the writings of the second century apostolic fathers. Matthew was a disciple. John was a disciple. Luke was an historian. And I'm going to read you a little bit from Luke later. Luke was an historian, and there was a man named William Ramsey who at the turn of the century, one of the most noted archaeologists of Great Britain, set out to Asia Minor A.D. That's called the Ben Asher text. Now you see the problem right away. The Old Testament is supposed to be the B.C. stuff, and the earliest manuscript we have is 1010 A.D. However, in another Jewish document called the Talmud, they mentioned that the rabbis were extremely meticulously careful when they copied things down. They'd stop periodically, go back and count the words. Well, for years, skeptics said, well, okay. So the Jews claimed they were careful. That doesn't mean they were careful. It just means they claimed they were careful. And there was room for doubt. That all changed in the year 1947, when in the Judean desert, a couple of young Arab boys were playing a game by throwing stones into a cave all of a sudden, they heard something shatter. They went inside, called the authorities, and they found hundreds upon hundreds of clay jars by a community called the Essene community or the Qumran community, which was kind of a Jewish cult that had gone up into the wilderness. And inside were copies of every portions of every single book in the Old Testament with the exception of Esther and the complete scroll of Isaiah. And when they compared it to the Ben Asher text, they found virtually no difference. But these scrolls, known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, date 150 B.C. We have now bridged a thousand-year gap and shown that the Jewish copyists were careful over a thousand years. Were the Dead Sea Scrolls the originals? No. But if they could be careful for a thousand years, they could have been careful a few years before that. With the New Testament, it's more close. Between 200 and 300 years are the most complete New Testament manuscripts. We have about 24 thousand of them, and we have some papyri fragments that go within 30 years of the originals, which were all completed by the end of the first century. Now, let me compare that to other history, because if a person wants to say, well, look, I don't have a time machine. I don't know Doc Brown or Marty McFly. We haven't turned a DeLorean into a time machine and gone back through time to see if Christ rose from the dead. So how do we know these books are accurate? You just threw out all of history. You can say that about the Bible, but you have to say that about all of history history. How many of you in your college campuses and your classes have ever heard your professor get up and tell you that Aristotle the philosopher never existed, never wrote anything? I took a lot of philosophy classes when I was in college. I never heard that. Did you know that from the time Aristotle lived and wrote to the earliest copy of an Aristotle manuscript, we have a time gap of 1,400 years? Sophocles, the Greek playwright, my undergraduate degree was in drama. I took a lot of drama literature classes. Never ever did a professor get up and say Sophocles didn't exist. Earliest copy of a Sophocles manuscript compared to when Sophocles lived and wrote, 1,500 years. So what do skeptics do? They go, well, given the careful way that things were copied and transmitted in those days, 1,400, 1,500 years, that's not really enough time to lose anything. Then they get to the New Testament. 30 years from the original? Oh my gosh! Do you know how much could have been changed during that time? We've got to play fair. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. The New Testament is so much more accurate in its transmission compared to anything else in ancient history, it's embarrassing to compare them. Now, I mentioned Luke. Luke was an actual historian sponsored by a Roman dignitary. And he says in his first chapter, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, O most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, what some people do is they go, well, you can't trust what the New Testament says about Jesus. The disciples were biased. They knew him. They liked him. Well, sure, they were biased. All people are biased. Winston Churchill was prime minister of England during the Second World War. 
He wrote a book called The Second World War. When you're reading that book, you think he has a biased view over who was right, England or Germany? But let me ask you another question. What historian in his right mind would be uninterested in a book written about World War II by Winston Churchill? And yet when it comes to Jesus, they go, well, uh, if Jesus was really a historical figure, then show me some people that can act as eyewitnesses that he existed. But the men that knew him most, lived with him, slept with him, ate with him, followed him around for three years, they don't count. That's nuts. We wouldn't do that for anything else. Having said that, we do have people with a bias predisposed against Jesus who did not like Jesus, and we have an ancient source from them too. The Talmud, a section called Sanhedrin 43a, says that Jesus was executed on the, past, on the Passover on the charge of sorcery and on the charge of apostasy. Now, why do they call him an apostate? Because he claimed to be God. Now, for an ancient Jew to claim to be God uh, that would be apostasy, unless he was telling the truth. But they didn't believe he was telling the truth. And yet here's what I'm intrigued about. Why did they call him a sorcerer? Because if you don't like somebody and you don't want to follow him, but you can't deny the fact that he did miracles, you go, oh, sure, he did miracles, but he didn't do it by God's power. He did it by Satan's. And there was an ancient Jewish historian named Josephus. He was not a Christian. His works are used all the time. Half the time when you read a Bible commentary, you're reading things from Josephus. Archaeologists depend on him all the time. And in Antiquities, chapter 18, the third section, he mentions that under Pontius Pilate, there was a man named Jesus who did miracles, who was executed, and who rose the third day. Now, a lot of people try to play this trick, and they go, oh, well, Josephus didn't really write that. Since it comes to us as a copy, some Christian must have stuck that in there. Problem is, bottom line, it's there, baby. It's there. There, in every extent, manuscript of Antiquities 18, section 3, it's there. If somebody wants to claim that Josephus didn't write it, the burden of proof is on them. Thank you. Uh, first, I always begin with the Muslim greeting of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Almighty God be upon you and upon your family. I mean, you enjoy the peace and blessings of God, the giver of peace, the giver of blessings. And only he does that. Um, I thought this uh, debate was about crucifixion of Jesus, but it was a commentary on the validity of the Bible, I guess, to justify the, uh, the contradicting of reports of the Bible that will come up about the crucifixion of Jesus as to the time that he was born. What day he, I mean, as to uh, the date of his crucifixion, what time he was crucified, who was at the crucifixion, who did he go to first for judgment, who was there when it came. You see, it's just not one or two or three. And what you must understand what my opponent is saying here is about the validity of the, he's going to try to build this case that the Bible is valid, so therefore these things that the Bible says about the crucifixion is valid. No. You see, the Bible says, at no, time was, at no time was revelation sent down by the private interpretation of men, but men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So therefore, the God that speaks in the Bible should know precisely at what time he or himself was crucified. On what day he himself was crucified? Who came to see him and himself when he was crucified? Who was there first when he was crucified? Who were the women that came to see him as God or Jesus when he was crucified? Where did they leave? Who did they speak to? Who did they not speak to? Contradiction upon contradiction upon contradiction upon the event that is considered by Christendom to be a 